Hello. Hello. How, How are, you? are you? I'm I'm so good. <laughs> it's really cool to have a ringside seat at my favorite radio show. Ah, uh, you're very kind. We're off to a good start. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there I was uh, watching you. Uh, I, I had a, a nice view from the stage uh, hosting the show last night. And as the name was called, my eyes went directly to you. And uh, um, you had an interesting look on your face. What, what was your first thought when your name was called last night as the winner of the Giller Prize? It's so funny because I was I was telling myself not to get all excited um, because I, I've been in situations where I, I, I've been at awards ceremonies and I've been nominated and uh, I've had that sort of zhuzh of adrenaline happening. And I remember I, I had my clutch bag open and I, I had my little speech and I just thought, okay, on the off chances that this happens, just have your hands on the speech so you don't forget it when you go up there. So I, I was clutching it, but at the same time, I was I was telling myself, no, 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 <laughs> don't get excited. Because when your name is not called, there's there's a bit of a crash. And I just, I wanted to have And fun. you have to have the happy face on still. You do have to have the happy face. And <laughs> you can't I, look too disappointed. <laughs> no, because, you know, all the, all the other writers are so worthy and so wonderful. And I wanted to be, I wanted to feel genuinely happy for them and not bad for myself. So I was basically just trying to keep my cool. And then when my name was called, it's like, oh, great, I don't have to keep my cool anymore. And I did not. <laughs> um, so you you were trying to convince yourself that this might not happen, but you did have a speech I did. ready. I did. So there was some thought that it could. I guess there was. You know, it's funny because uh, in 2011, when I was nominated for The Antagonist, um, I did not I did not have a speech ready. And I, I was hopeful, but I, I think I just had – sometimes you just have a feeling and so or an intuition. Uh, and with this, I mean, I I was hopeful this time around as well. But um, I I had a I have a friend who's a little bit psychic, and uh, she sort of made a pronouncement to me a few weeks ago. And um, it you know people will say the, these things to you, and normally I just go la la la. I, I can't hear you. I don't I don't want to think about winning or losing. But uh, this one particular friend, I, she just seems so certain and confident. So what did she say? She said, I think you're going to win. Wow. Yeah, yeah, in very confident tones, and uh, I couldn't really discount statement. it. There was no, there was no uh, discounting, yeah. Um, well, let me, let me just play it. This is a little clip of, uh, of your speech after you won. This is Lynn Cody winning the Giller Prize last night. I think probably the only way for me to keep it together is, is just to read from this page. So I'm going, to, I'm going to hold on to these pages for dear life. It won't be spontaneous, but uh, it will say all the things I want to say right now. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is shocking and overwhelming. And I don't even like to cry in private, so <laughs> this, is, this is very odd for me. <laughs> That's Lynn Cody winning the Giller Prize last night at the beginning of your speech. You, you sounded, I mean, you do sound very self-aware. You're, 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 it was funny because going into the show last night, we knew that I was going to talk to all of the authors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and from your writing, I wouldn't know this, by the way, but I was told, you know, Lynn's kind of nervous about coming on stage. Be kind to her. <laughs> I'm not going to ambush her in the middle <laughs> of the show. You were very kind. But, uh, but uh, how, how was your comfort level at, at getting up and doing the speech once you'd, uh, once you'd won? Did it feel like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the establishment now? <laughs> once okay. I had won. Well, you know what? I, I do best. I mean, I think the reason I was a a bit nervous about the onstage portion of the evening with you and Wendy is uh, spontaneity kind of terrifies me and the idea of getting up and speaking off the cuff like I'm I just have this deep fear that I'll be overtaken by Tourette's and <laughs> something will come out of my mouth that I will not be able to take back so uh, that was another reason for the speech I thought if I just have something to read I you know what what I'm confident in after all these years is my writing not so much my my talking. So I thought if I just have something to read, I, I should probably be okay. Well, you are confident. You're right. One of the nice things that y you said to me right after the, uh, after you'd won last night is, uh, I said, can you accept that you deserve this? And you said, you actually said, yeah, you know, I've worked yeah. really hard. Can you speak to that? I can, but I just want to say, I mean, last night I, I was, asked, I was answering a lot of questions <laughs> and it's really difficult to answer questions that are, are basically along those lines like how awesome are you do you think you're awesome um it, it's hard to you know sure. maintain the All requisite right. canadian humility disclaimer <laughs> issue go ahead now thank you um well yeah i mean i have i have been writing for a long time i've kind of been in the trenches of canadian publishing which is 
which is these waters are not always salubrious, as you know, um, since 1998, uh, when my first novel came out, Strange Heaven. Um, and uh, I've, I just feel like I know the terrain. I've met all the people. I love all the people. Um, and I've, I've worked really hard. I've, I've published six books, which seems kind of like a lot of books. And so it's... Uh, it's and you're a previous nominee. Yes, yeah. So it's it's great to, you know, have this little capper on the Salubrious? career. Salubrious? Yeah, you know, that's a... I don't know what it means. What does it mean? That's a fancy word. It's a uh, great word. <laughs> the waters are not salubrious. Uh, calm and ah. and soothing. Not necessarily all the time. Um, how, how have the last 12 hours been? Have you slept? I managed to sleep. Uh, my husband kind of pulled me out of the Nancy party uh, well mm-hmm. before midnight, which was... I had sort of asked him to do um and so that was a very good thing because it took it took about an hour of just sort of lying staring with my eyes wide open uh just wearing letting the adrenaline wear off before i could really fall asleep you said something last night um a few of us have said, I, 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 I use the term rock stars, but you, you said, so you said last night that you love living in this country where authors are, can be like movie stars. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, do, you, do you always believe that to be true? Is that something you, you take uh, great pride in in Canada? Yes. I mean, I, I really do. I, I love about this country the way we value our literary culture. Our arts culture in general, but um, it seems to me our, our literary culture in particular, it's just something we've always uh, really nurtured in more than, than some of our cultural industries. Um, you know, it took, it took a while for the Canadian music industry to become the incredible force that it is now. Uh, but it feels to me like, uh, like Canadian literature has always, uh, as as difficult a field as as publishing can sometimes be, has always been a real force, uh, and it's always enjoyed incredible cachet amongst the people of Canada because I th- I think Canadians know how valuable it is and how how distinctive our literature makes us. Yeah, it continues to grow too. I think the power of Canadian writers and and the love of Canadian readers. Although I tweeted that um, about how I love. Uh, that living in a country where the authors are the rock stars and Corey Redekop, who's a great pop culture writer, mm-hmm. said, well, that makes me a, a, a subway musician playing a, a, a harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> but he's on his way up. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you know, I guess consistent with how well Canadian writing is doing, and we'd be remiss not to mention Alice Munro. And, and I mentioned in the introduction, this has been a terrific year for the short story after Alice's Nobel Prize and now you're Giller. Do you think her precedent... Uh, she won the Giller a couple of times before, has helped short stories to be taken more seriously rather than some kind of experiments on the road to a novel? You're a novelist who's written a couple of books of short stories, this being one of them. Mm-hmm. What's your perspective on the way the short story is treated now? Um, you know, I think Alice Munro and the incredible success and belovedness of her work uh, really gives people pause. Uh, and when I say people, I actually mean the marketers <laughs> in the book industry. Um, because, I, I mean, the, the thing that makes uh, short fiction kind of the redheaded stepchild of publishing uh, is, is simply, like, it, it's dollars and cents. It just doesn't sell as well as novels for whatever reason. As much as your publisher might support it and as your editor might love it, it's just it's just sort of a fact of um, of economics. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, the fact is Alice Munro is an incredibly distinctive talent entirely in her own atmosphere, but uh, just the fact that she's made the choice to work ex- exclusively in this form, I think really makes people sit up and take notice and realize how legitimate a form it is, how splendid it can be, how distinctive from uh, the novel. It's it's very much a, a thing unto itself, and um, it really, I, I think it really stands alongside of long form. As You've a, said that a short story can't hide behind bad writing. Yeah, that, uh, Richard Ford actually said that, and I kind of cribbed it, but mm-hmm. um, it's it's true. The, the thing about the short story is, with novels... I think the the actual quote from Richard Ford was, uh, "Good writing over here covers up for bad writing over there," and you just you have that sprawl where you can you can just be a little half-assed in a novel if you absolutely chapter need seven to you be. can phone in chapter you seven you can phone it in from time to time. But uh, with short fiction, um, uh, this is a quote from Francine Prose: "Every word has to go on trial for its life uh, because there are so few words in there, and you know the half-assed." 
sentence is um, really going to be glaring. So heaven forbid you write it. I really enjoyed this book, and uh, Thank and, you. and also uh, it's provocative at times. Uh, uh, let's talk about Hell Going, your your winning collection of short stories, which are often focused on the complications of sex and sexual relationships. You gave an, an interview last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, where you talked about how it was hard for you to write about sex because of your Catholic upbringing. Mm -hmm. What changed? I'm growing up, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just shedding some of those inhibitions. And I mean, the fact is, when I gave that interview, uh, I I was a little bit frustrated to find myself on that side of the interview. It's just like, how, how long am I going to be stunted (laughs) <laughs> in, in this aspect of my development. And I have such admiration for writers who are just able to tackle that subject head on. Lisa Moore is an incredible sure. example. She writes some of the most beautiful sex scenes I've, I've ever read. Um, and I really admire that, that ability to just kind of embrace that side of humanity, warts and all. And go for it. Um, I don't know if I necessarily do that in Hell Going. I mean, I think the way I handle sex is to be incredibly matter of fact in a way that somewhat drains it of all actual sexiness. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's that's just so. My it was a conscious take. effort to write about sex. Yeah, not really. I think it's just uh, it's where my process has taken me at this point. It, it very much is just a function of I'm I'm in my forties now just letting it all hang out to a greater extent. One story in this collection that's got a lot of attention, as you know, is An Other World, mm. because of the nature of the sexual relationship in it. Uh, the main couple, yeah. Sean and Aaron, yeah. are really, really into S&M. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got their dungeon. Uh, given the presence of a church pew in the couple's sex dungeon, you, you make an outright connection between religion, Catholicism, mm-hmm. uh, and that kind of sex. W- what was the connection you were trying to explore, Lynn? <laughs> oh, dear. Well, um... I, I I don't think it's new necessarily to uh, to make that connection between Catholicism and uh, S and M. You know, Catholicism has a, a bit of a Gothic history, and there's the um, the mortification of the flesh, and uh, um, I could go on. I'm not sure how much I want to go on in in the morning, but um, I I just think uh, I think the connections are there. I think. Catholicism is a fascinating and compelling religion because it does have this, uh, it does have this dark side. And, you know, there's like, you know, all the kind of weird sexualized aspects mm. of Catholicism, like, you know, the Catholic schoolgirl, just as one example, um, that ends up becoming fetishized. It's a, it's a religion that's, that kind of lends itself to a certain fetishization. Well, in a review of your book in the Globe and Mail, Jeet Heer said about you that Catholicism is a pervasive presence in her work, the cultural soil she sprang from that still nurtures her imagination. So w- what is your relationship to religion today? How do you think that informs your work? Uh, you know, I think it, it's still a, a great force in um, in my imagination and my creativity. Um, and it, it always ends up coming out in ways I do not expect. The Antagonist uh, in 2011 was, in, in a lot of ways, all about th- this character's conversation with God and the universe and um, thinking about his role within it and, and contemplating God as, you know, Basically, as an antagonist, the antagonist in some ways in that book is is God or the way my character Rank sees him. Um, and I, ju- I don't plan on doing this sort of thing. When I sit down to write a story like The Antagonist or Another World, I don't think I'm going to be consciously bringing religion into it. But uh, it's just, I think... But there it is. There it is. I think Jeet's right. I think it's just, it's a cultural soil from which I sprang, and it's just something that informs everything I write. You've been studying TV writing at the Canadian Film yeah. Center. Are you still going to pursue that now that you're the big Giller Prize winner? Oh, yes. I mean, I am loving it. And talk about, like, religion rearing its... Some might say ugly head in my work. I've been I've been working on pitches right now, uh, so we're we're trying to decide on projects to develop. And you know, I had a sci-fi, and I had a comedy, and I had a drama. And once I just wrote them out to present to my group, but it's all religion. Almost every single story has has these clear over religious overtones. North America is listening to you right now. 
But uh, the Giller Prize is a big Canadian prize, and you're a real Canadian story. And uh, I, I think you, I think of you as a real Pan Canadian. Uh, uh, you studied at Carleton in Ottawa. You spent some time in New Brunswick. You studied at UBC in Vancouver. You live in Edmonton. You're considered Edmonton's Lynn Cody, uh, and yet your roots are in Cape Breton. Yes, and um, uh, that's where you you grew up. And Cape Breton is clearly listening. Uh, uh, la- last night when I said, "Who do you share this award with?" After the after you got it, you said Cape Breton. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Well, you know, Cape Breton, my Catholicism, my small town world, working class worldview. It's all kind of part and parcel, uh, and it all has prof- informed my work profoundly. I think. I, th- I think there's something about growing up on a, a slightly xenophobic island um, of very distinctive cultural. Uh, Overtones, in, it's in Cape Breton. It's Scottish, as I'm sure you know. Um, that just imbues you with a very distinctive and particular worldview. And part of what's been so wonderful about being Pan Canadian is, um, you know, you know, the thing about Cape Breton is a sort of when I talk about, I, I say xenophobic with all affection, but. You, there's always the people from away, and then there's the normal people who are the people <laughs> you grow up with, the people who live on the island, the people who have the same accents as you. Uh, and so it was it was fascinating to kind of go out into the world as a Cape Bretoner and discover not everyone in Canada is a Cape Bretoner. Not <laughs> everyone in Canada drinks tea from nine of them in the morning <laughs> till nine at night. Not everyone's a Catholic. Um, and probably... Probably the biggest wake-up call for me was was going straight from the East Coast to the West Coast when right. I went out to UBC and discovered Vancouver has its own culture, and it's it's very much the opposite of what I grew up with, and uh, and, and that's what that's what I just love about this country. Every every region is its own thing, and yet we all have we all share a lot. We've learned, we finally learned what uh, Persians and Cape Bretoners intensely have in common. Tea from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. <laughs> uh, what, a, what, a, what a pleasure it is to have you here. Congratulations. Thank you. Be well. I will. Enjoy. <laughs> good, good luck out there in the world as a Giller Prize winner.